Repeat this after me. My heart is open. My mind is ready. Make me better, God. While I'm busy telling you silly stories, let me tell you a story that happened in my life 25 years ago. I got married 25 years ago. Can you believe it? It's insane to think about it. And I'm only 35. I mean, my dad actually got me married when I was seven. It's true. No, it's not true. 25 years ago, we got married. And you know, when we started out in life, we literally had nothing. You know, sometimes people maybe look at me and think, well, Mark, you know, what kind of trouble does he have? He's a successful realtor and he's got a construction company and a nice home and a fancy vehicle. And, you know, how can I relate to Mark? Well, let me tell you, I started with zero, actually less than zero. When, when, when I married Rhea, we doubled our debt in one day. We just added our debts together and doubled them, right? And we started out with nothing. We had to figure out how to follow God and how to grow and how to develop and how to prosper in Him. Amen? Well, when we got married, we, we had really nothing. We couldn't even afford a decent honeymoon. So we borrowed my dad's burgundy Plymouth Voyager van. It was ugly. We had us a pup tent and a cook stove, a dinghy, and a dog. And we went on our honeymoon. We drove over to Salt Spring Island on our honeymoon. And we couldn't even afford the fee at the provincial park. So we looked for an empty field that we thought maybe was crown land. And we set up camp. And guess what? It wasn't crown land. <laughs> we met the owner that night. And he was kind enough to let us stay. We have a little video of him saying, fine, you can stay. Right? So that was our, that was our I don't know, second or third night being married and camping on somebody else's land on Salt Spring Island with the Burgundy Plymouth Voyager. Boy, I tell you, it's our 25th anniversary. We're not going out in a Plymouth Voyager this time. I'm telling you, I'm thinking Canary Islands. That's what I'm thinking. Who's with me? I've got big plans. So anyways, yeah, yeah my kids want to come with me. I'm like, no. I'm like, wow, we're going to go to Spain. No, you're not. Just mom and dad are. So here we are on Salt Spring Island. And we blew up our dinghy full of air. And we went down to this beach. And we saw this, this little island kind of out in the, in the straits. You know, the straits of Georgia there. So we thought, well, let's go out to that island and have a picnic. So we got in our dinghy. And we rowed out to this island. And we sat in the sun and suntanned. And we had our picnic. And we had a real good time. And then it was kind of getting late in the afternoon. We thought, you know, we better get back across the strait here. And uh, we, we went over to the dinghy. And guess what? It was running out of air. It was, it was, it was, yeah. And so we got in the dinghy and, and the air was leaking and the tides had changed. And the beach was over there, but the tide was going over there. And now we're in the dinghy and I'm rowing like mad and my wife's starting to panic, you know. And we're rowing against the current trying to get back over to Salt Spring Island and the air is leaking out of the dinghy and it's kind of sinking lower and lower into the sea. And you know, when those things kind of get deflated, they're harder to row. She's singing every praise song she can think of. She is every song you can, she is singing and she is praying and I am rowing and we are panicking and we're drifting out to sea. And we're, we're just going right. I'm thinking, man, we are going out into the Straits of Georgia with the dog. Where are we going to end up? We were adrift at sea. It's pretty scary. You know, it's a scary thing to be drifting along in life, being pulled this way and that way by the currents of life. And you're rowing like mad to go where you think you need to go and you can't get there. And that's kind of what we experienced. We eventually made it back to Salt Spring Island, but several miles down shore, from where our car was parked and it was like the steep rugged hillside and so we kind of uh, flattened out the dinghy and put it on my shoulders and hiked up this rugged hillside and ended up in a hippie camp yeah it smelled good and they weren't wearing very many clothes <laughs> so we left the hippie camp <laughs> remember we knocked on that door and that lady answered and it was like oh nice to meet you thank you <laughs> we'll just keep on going <laughs> yeah and so we found a road and walked down the road and eventually a man with clothes on stopped in his car and gave us a ride <laughs> but i'm saying all that story to say this sometimes events come along in our lives and they seem to set us adrift in a sea that we're powerless to overcome. Maybe it's a doctor's report or a financial struggle. Maybe it's a teenager that wants to go their own way or a relationship that's failing. But things happen. And sometimes all it takes is one word, one sentence. And it can just literally throw our life into disarray. Isn't that right? Suddenly everything changes. 
and were launched adrift in the sea of uncertainty and despair. At times like that, we need an anchor for our souls. I was talking to a friend of mine, and he was telling me a story about his cousin, and their, their family went on holidays to Hawaii. And uh, they got there, and they were kind of playing on the ocean, and, and his cousin, she's a girl, she's a teenage girl, she was going to learn to surf, and she was fiddling around on the surfboard, and, you know, there weren't very many waves, it was kind of calm there, and so she kind of stretched out on that surfboard and fell asleep. And her family was, you know, suntan and doing whatever they were doing on the beach, and she started drifting out to ocean. Three hours later, mom and dad realized she was gone. They couldn't see her. They looked out to the ocean. That she, they couldn't see her. She'd gone so far, they couldn't see her. And she slept for three hours on that surfboard. <laughs> when she woke up, she was way out in the ocean. They weren't even looking in the ocean. They were searching up and down the beach for her. Well, guess what? She got a burn so bad, she spent the next two days in bed from a sunburn. That's how she spent. She needed an anchor. She was drifting. And you know, many of us feel like we're drifting in life. We're drifting in our marriages, drifting in our finances, drifting in our health. There's no land in sight. There's no hope for our lives. And we need an anchor in times like that that we can hold on to. We need to know how to put our anchor down into God and trust in Him. And tonight, the, the, the name of the message tonight is Anchored in His Glory. Amen. We're going to start by looking at Hebrews chapter 6. If you can put that up on the screen, Oakley. So God has given both his promise and his oath. And these two things are unchangeable because it's impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls it leads us through the curtain into god's inner sanctuary jesus has already gone in there for us and he has become our eternal high priest in the order of melchizedek there's an anchor for our souls when we go through times of difficulty and turmoil when you feel battered by the waves of life and the circumstances that are coming against you there's an anchor available you can be anchored in Him. You can be anchored in His glory. You know, you might think you're going through something and you don't know how you're going to make it. You know, I remember a few years ago and going through a time of financial struggle and I kind of felt, I kind of felt like this. Once a month I went, got up to the top and went, <gasps> and then back down I went into the turmoil, you know, and then struggled to get up and I kind of get up through the waves financially and go, <gasps> And down I'd go again. You know what I'm talking about? And life can be like that. Where you feel like you can hardly breathe. And you wonder, how will I ever get through? I remember feeling like this. I remember feeling, you know, if one more problem comes, I don't think I'll survive. I, I've had enough bad news to last me a lifetime, just in this month alone. If I get one more bad report, I just don't think I'll make it. And guess what? Here I am, because I have an anchor for my soul. Amen? We need to come to a place of realization that God is working through our circumstance for his glory. See, when we realize it's really all about him, it's not about me. My problems aren't about me. My struggles aren't about me. My problems are actually an opportunity for him to get glory in my life. It's about Him. And when our life becomes about giving God glory, our perspective changes. And this is point number one tonight. If you're taking notes, write this down. Obstacles and opposition are actually an opportunity for God to get glory in your life. Have you ever had the experience of sharing with someone something that God's done in your life in the past? A struggle that you faced and how God saw you through it? It was for His glory. I want us to look at this story tonight from John chapter 9. And this is one of the stories where Jesus heals a blind man. One of, I think, the greatest miracles that actually Jesus does. Because this man is blind from birth. So you understand when a child is born and they learn to see, 
all kinds of neurons are connecting in their brains to make their sight work, right? So when Jesus heals a man who's blind from birth, not only do his eyes work, but all that nerve connection is suddenly put together in one instant. It's a huge miracle. It's a fantastic miracle. And the, here's the story. We'll pick it up in uh, John 9, verse 1. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sin or his parents' sin? And Jesus answers, it's not because of his sin or his parents' sin. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. Isn't that powerful? His problem was an opportunity for God to demonstrate his glory. That's a new perspective on our problems, isn't it? Jesus says we must quickly carry out the tasks assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming and then no one can work. But while I'm here in the world, I am the light of the world. And then Jesus spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva and spread the mud over the blind, man, blind man's eyes. And he told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. And so the man went and washed and came back seeing. His obstacle was an opportunity for God's glory. Have you ever faced a problem so big there was no way you could get through it? You know, somebody once said, God won't give you more than you can handle. You ever heard that saying? You know, don't worry, God won't give you more than you can handle. I got a news flash for you. That's a lie. He's given me more stuff that I couldn't handle. In fact, the truth is, if you're walking with God, you're going to face stuff you can't handle all the time. He's going to ask you to do stuff that's impossible. He's going to send you places that you can't go and tell you to do things that are too big for you. Do you always face things that are bigger than you are? Why? Because then you have to look to God for the answer. The truth is, you'll always face stuff that's too big for you to handle, but you can handle it when you learn to trust in God. Amen? Have you ever faced a problem where there was simply nothing you could do about it? This man was blind from birth. You can't positive think your way out of that problem. You know what I'm saying? You can't positive think your way into eyes that work. You got eyes that don't work. Either you live with that or you receive a miracle. You know what I'm talking about? There isn't a self-help book out there that can get your sight back. You need an answer from God. And many times we face things where we need an answer from God if we're going to get through. And in those moments, those are the exciting moments. When I face difficulties and problems and things that seem insurmountable, I always tell myself, this is an opportunity for me to see God do something great. Instead of worrying, instead of being upset, instead of being confused, and instead of being tossed around and battered around by the waves of life, I just tell myself, this is an opportunity for me to see God do something exciting. It's an opportunity for God to get glory. Amen? I want us to take a moment and just notice the disciples' critical attitude of the blind man. Isn't it interesting how they were thinking? They come along and they see a man with a problem, and they say, okay, here's a guy with a problem. Is it his sin or his parents' sin? Who's to blame here? And you know, often we do that to each other, don't we? We see somebody running into some financial struggle, maybe in their business, and we start thinking, hmm, he probably didn't manage his business well. He's probably lazy or something. You know, he probably procrastinates or he probably was dishonest. We see someone maybe struggling with marriage problems and we think, oh, yeah, uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, there's a sign that something's wrong with their life. You know, you see someone struggling, struggling with a teenager that's kind of going sideways. And you start thinking, well, you know, I wonder what happens in their home. Ah, oh, there's probably some hidden sin in the parents. That's why the teenagers act in that way. Right? You know, that they're just teenagers. Give them a break. Don't you remember being one? But, you know, we tend to do that. We tend to judge people, right? I remember being in church, and, and in this particular church, you know, if you started having a cold and you still told someone you are feeling sick, they kind of criticized you for that. Where's your faith? 
Your faith isn't strong enough. That's why you got that cold. Your faith isn't strong enough. That's why your business is failing. Your faith isn't strong enough. That's why your health isn't good. Maybe he's not walking with God the way he should be. Or maybe God isn't pleased with something in his life. You know, people love to judge and criticize and theologize about our problems instead of what? Just kind of getting together with us and praying and believing and encouraging. Why do we do that? You know, Jesus didn't say, oh, yeah, well, his parents were real, you know, bad people. And, you know, you go back three and four generations, and boy, you can just see that pattern of sin. No wonder he was born blind. No, Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, well, his problem is an opportunity for God to get glory. Let's see what we can do here. Isn't that interesting? You know, God has chosen to demonstrate his glory through broken humanity. I think that's pretty awesome because that means, hey, there's hope for me. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? God has chosen to display his glory through broken and imperfect humanity. So it's normal for us to have problems. It's normal for us to go through difficulties. It's normal for us to face a crisis and have to look to God so He can display His glory and His grace in us. Amen? We have a choice. Whenever we face problems and difficulties, we can live in the sinking sand of defeat or our own inability, our own lack, or we can take our circumstance to the rock who can transform lives and change lives. Amen? That's the anchor. That's the anchor is understanding that when we have problem and difficulty, we don't have to sort it out. We don't have to solve it all. We just need to go to the one who can and understand that our problem is his opportunity. Amen? Number two, if you're taking notes, your answer is based on his grace, not on your works. That's the anchor for your soul. Your answer is based on His grace, not on your works. The anchor is His grace. It's not about you or how good you are or what you've done right or what you've done wrong. It never has been. It never will be. If that's what it was all about, we'd all be in trouble and none of us would be sitting here tonight. But God really isn't interested in our list. He's not interested in all the things that we hold against ourselves. He's not interested in all the ways that we think we've failed so much that He can never bless us. He's not interested in all the things that we think we've done to impress Him and earn His grace and favor either. He just loves us the way we are. And we can rest and relax in that grace and in that love. And we can trust Him. If you want to be anchored in Him, you've got to quit trusting in you. As long as your focus is on yourself, you'll miss the blessing of God in your life. Now, I'm not saying, if you're struggling financially, that maybe you shouldn't go take a course on how to take care of your finances. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying, if your health is bad, that maybe you shouldn't look at how you can live a healthier life and eat better food and exercise. you got to do those things. I'm not saying if you're struggling in business that maybe you shouldn't go and take some courses and learn how to run your business better. I'm not saying if you're having a hard time with your kids that maybe you shouldn't sign up for a life group that talks about how to raise kids and learn something. Those things are all important and valuable, but that's not what you trust in. You do those things as a, as a part of being responsible, taking responsibility for your life, but you don't trust in your ability to fix everything. By doing that, even though you're doing these things, you trust in the grace of God. And you put your anchor there. That's where the anchor is. All of those things are kind of like the paddles, you know. you got to paddle the boat, but sometimes paddling isn't enough, and you need an anchor, and the anchor is grace. Does that make sense? Is that good? Our hope is in the promises of God. And in His grace, that's the anchor. In fact, Jesus has already gone into the Holy of Holies on our behalf. The Bible says that when Jesus rose from the dead, that literally He took His blood into the Holy of Holies in heaven for God. So that we could be atoned for our sin once and for all times. Every mistake you've ever made, every wrong thing you've ever done is wiped out and erased in the Holy of Holies. Jesus went there on our behalf. And guess what? We can go there. 
I was talking to a parent the other day, and they had they had struggled with one of their children for year after year after year. And th- this child was just so rebellious. And they struggled. They loved their child. They were good parents. I'm telling you, they were great parents. But this child was headstrong and would go the wrong way. And this child, as a young adult, got into all kinds of trouble, even to almost the point of losing their life. And one day, this these parents said, you know what, we're going to go before the throne of heaven. We're going to go to God's throne. We're going to go in to the Holy of Holies and stand before the throne of God. We are going to ask for our child. And you know what? God did a miracle and revealed himself in a miraculous way to that child in their room. Changed their life. We have the ability to go and stand before God with the deepest, hardest struggles of our lives and bring them to him. Amen? Amen. Parents, be encouraged. No such thing as a perfect parent anyways. You're going to mess up. There's a news flash for you. Nobody's ever been a perfect parent. Every parent is going to make a mistake and mess up. But you can trust in God for your kids. Amen? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 to 16. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weakness, for he faced all of the same testing we do, yet he did not sin. So watch this. Let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God, and there we'll receive his mercy. And we'll find grace to help us when we need it most. There are some problems in your life too big for you to handle. And you have an anchor for your soul called the grace of God. And you can go boldly into his presence and stand before him and receive the help you need. Amen? You don't have to earn your answer. The fact is you can't earn your answer nobody can earn a miracle from God nobody can earn his favor and his blessing you're not that good and you never will be you just have to trust in his grace and in his promises amen what did the blind man do to receive his miracle do you realize he didn't even know who Jesus was this blind man he was kind of clueless Did you realize that? This is one situation. Quite often, Jesus would perform a miracle and he would say something like this, your faith has made you whole. Right? He would say, be it unto you according to your faith. As you have believed, let it be done. Right? But you know, in this case, this blind man didn't have any faith at all. He was just sitting by the road begging. He didn't even know who Jesus was. He didn't know if he believed. And Jesus came to him with grace and transformed his life. And I want to see this. The miracle came first. The faith, the transformation of his life actually came later. And there's a reason why I'm saying that. Because so often we put pressure on ourselves to, to drum up enough faith. And we think if we're not getting the answer, that it's because our faith isn't strong enough. And we've got to somehow make more faith happen. What we got to do is just look to him and trust and know that he's got a plan. So watch this. Jesus comes. This blind man gets healed and everybody starts making trouble for him. First his family. Then he goes to the temple and they start making trouble for him. Those religious leaders, right? And Jesus comes and finds him later after he's kind of had all this conflict. And Jesus says, it says, actually, we'll go John 9, verse 35. Oakley, if you want to put that up. When Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man. He heard that everyone was picking on him. They actually kicked him out of the temple. And so Jesus went and found him and said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Watch this. He answered, "Uh, No. Who is he? (laughs) Like, he didn't even know who Jesus was. Like, who's the Son of Man? I'd like to believe in him. I think I'd like to believe. The guys already have the miracle. He's gone from blind to seeing. Jesus says, do you believe? He says, I don't know, but I'd like to. And Jesus says, you've seen him. In fact, he is speaking to you. And at that moment, the blind man believes. And he says, 
Lord, I believe, and he worships Jesus. Notice that the, the disciples criticized this blind man. The relig religious leaders rejected him, but Jesus healed him all before he had the chance to believe. Jesus is being merciful. Religion is being malicious. Isn't that right? Religion is malicious. Religion will eat your lunch every time. You know, religion's a terrible, terrible thing because religion sets up a standard that nobody can reach and then criticizes people for not being there. But Jesus doesn't do that. He accepts people right where they are. And he touches them. You know, Jesus was bringing the broken before he believed. And watch this. Religion was kicking him out when he believed. We have a saying that I like to say here at our church. Belong before you believe. People need a place where they belong. They need to be loved. They need to be accepted. They need to be welcomed. They need to just be lavished with the grace of God and the blessing and the goodness of God. I hope our church is a place where people can come to Jesus without feeling condemned, without feeling criticized, and without, <coughs> excuse me, without being scrutinized. You know what I mean? People don't need us to scrutinize their life. They simply need to be able to come and receive from God as they are. Wouldn't it be wonderful to see people healed and touched by God and their lives already starting to change before they even realize that they're starting to believe? Isn't that an awesome idea? Jesus used the healing to bring this man to salvation. And I want us to understand this tonight out of this story. Jesus can rescue you by his grace even when your faith doesn't feel strong enough. You just trust him. Just trust him and obey. The blind man actually did one thing. Jesus said, go wash your eyes in the river. And he said, okay. And he obeyed. That's all he did. Jesus said, go do this. And he said, well, I don't really know who you are. And I don't know why you put this mud all over my eyes, but okay. I guess I'll go wash. Isn't that something? The third point in, in really learning how to get our, our anchor in his glory, get our anchor down deep, is to hold fast to your confession of faith. Amen? Set your sights on the promises of God's word and hold on tight. Don't let the waves or the words of others discourage you or dissuade you. Look intently into the word of God. Whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, begin to look at the Bible and see what God's Word says about your situation and then hang on tight. Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. And I, like, I love to read it in the Message Bible. It says, Let's keep a firm grip on the promises that keep us going. You can keep on going when you have a firm grip on God's promises, He always keeps His Word. So just begin to declare the promises of God in your situation. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says I'm blessed. The Bible says that I am healthy. The Bible says that my generations, my children will be blessed, that they will declare His glory, that my kids will be powerful in the land. The Bible says that I can produce wealth. And on and on and on. There's a promise I really believe for every situation you can face. God's already got a promise for you in His Word, the Bible. And you can trust in Him. You can be confident in His promises. Amen? So remember, your obstacle is simply an opportunity for God's glory. It's not a problem. It's a possibility. See that He's working through your circumstance for His glory. He actually has a plan you might not see it you might not understand it but god has a plan the bible says in all these things we are more than conquerors amen that means in all the struggles and all the trials and all the difficulties we can still be conquerors and the bible says that god works everything together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose and whatever obstacle or opposition you're facing in your life it's an opportunity. He has a plan. Amen? Your answer is based on His grace, not your works. And really not even your faith. Sometimes 
it's just too much to believe. And you got to have someone else come believe with you. You know what I'm talking about? You need a brother or sister or two or three or five that can come stand alongside you and believe with you. Amen. It's not about you. It's all about him. So take your eyes off yourself and your circumstance and look to God. You can't earn his blessing. Jesus paid the price. He paved the way. It's his grace. It's his love for you. That's the anchor. Amen. And hold fast to your confession of faith. Find the promises of God in his word that speak to your situation and hang on tight. Keep speaking them. Keep thanking God for them. Keep declaring them. That's the anchor for your soul. Amen. So let's be anchored in his glory and for his glory. Amen.